Hey, what YouTube is Cash for Civil is my is it? It's the Queen Days of Our Life documentary part one. This was the first documentary you guys wanted me to react to, so there's like three other ones, and so I'm just gonna do this one. It's a little confusing. I don't know which. Even this one, the part one, like there's like different YouTube channels doing like different parts. If you're new to the channel, want to support, like, come and subscribe. And there's like greetings from like Germany, greetings from France, all types of places. Like, you got if you're not even speaking English and you're watching me react to stuff, that's crazy, bro. Like. If you're speaking English and you're watching me react, it's crazy. I, I don't know why you guys like the channel, but <laughs> I'm, it's a queen channel. You're going to like it. But you guys are obviously queen fans, so that's probably why you like it. You guys don't like me. There's been a lot of rumors lately kidding, kidding. about certain bands or queen. The rumors are that we're going to split up. What do you think? They're talking from here. But forget those rumors. We're going to stay together until we fucking will die. I'm sure there really wasn't much sex and well there wasn't much drugs i tell you you'd be able to do that now would you Like a girl, like a like you. I remember that it was like the the booze video on the train, and you guys are like, oh, that's Roger's girlfriend, and like they have kids again. What, Roger, man? Come on. For that moment, we kind of owned the world. Where's the motor stick on? Well, there isn't any. For reasons I never quite understood, a lot of the press took against them. England doesn't really think we're that cool. But I mean, I don't want some asshole critic to tell me that. You might as well sort of paint a target on your head and, and go, you shoot me. I think when you go all the way up, the only place is to come down. Controversy behind Sun City, which I've never heard of the place. I was gonna, like, I can, I was gonna put subtitles for you guys, but nah, it's okay. Whenever the band came under pressure, there would be a walkout, a separation, a run. We were at a really crucial point. We might have had to, to break up. The other things were creative, and then it would become personal. <laughs> of course. We know. We saw it. In good jealousy. And they're all wondering and all waiting for us to see if, if say, my album's going to do better than the last Queen album. Freddie took to the gay scene like David Attenborough making a wildlife program. Just want to pack in as much of life and having a good time as much as I can. That's a good intro. That is actually a really good London, intro. London, the Imperial College of Science and Technology. Meeting place for space scientists from 50 nations. Specialists who have helped develop the equipment which has taken mankind into the new age of space exploration. We've got Ryan May on guitar. <laughs> if Brian May walked past me, bro, I would not know how to act. I would not know how to act. I was studying physics as an undergraduate here. But astronomy was always my thing. And so I did the astronomy postgraduate for a PhD. When we were at school, me and my mates had a group called 1984. And when I left for university, the singer that we had, Tim Staffel, and myself decided to put a new group together called Smile. We've got Roger Meadows Taylor on percussion. <coughs> There's a notice board somewhere here where you would pin items that were of interest to musicians. So this is where I put my notice saying drummer wanted. We need Ginger Baker, Mitch Mitchell type drummer. <laughs> I booked this little jazz club room here and Roger brought his kit in. I brought a guitar and that was the first time we played together. It was, it was an advertisement? <laughs> Something happened. I have to say, we thought, hmm, there is some kind of special sound to this group. I guess we have the same sort of sound in our heads. Is this their song? This song this sounds nice. Freddie 
Freddie Mercury on bubbles. Freddie came from a colonial background. He was born in Zanzibar and he went to bowling school in India. I first met Freddie at Ealing Art School in 1968. And there was a piano down there and Freddie would do this kind of flowery style on the piano and he was very Mozart and affected but unique, you know. You'd never seen anybody play the piano like that before. I've never seen anything. The first time he sang, you knew straight away that that voice was going places. Did you walk in the joint? I used to follow a sort of smile a lot, you know, I used to say, I mean, we were like friends, I used to go to their shows. Freddie was waiting in the wings, literally, and, and advising us on what to do. And he would always say, you know, you guys are brilliant, 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 it's amazing, but, you know, you should do this and you should do this. What did you see in, in what Brian and Roger were doing with Smile? Nothing. Nice <laughs> I think he sort of had in the back of his mind maybe, a, you know, some, some idea about maybe working with us. Freddie told everybody that he was going to be a pop star and we didn't take it that seriously really. And uh, he was sitting over there one night and I, I walked in the pub and he just put his head in his hands like this and looking really depressed. And I walked over and said, what's, what's the matter with you? And I said, I'm not going to be a pop star. And uh, very slowly he stood up and he said, um, I'm going to be... A legend. <laughs> <laughs> Freddie is so corny. What the hell? Although <laughs> we had a lot of successful gigs and we played colleges and we played pubs and small clubs up and down the country, we just never got anywhere. Smile made a single which did nothing at all and then Tim, our singer, got an offer from someone else and the someone else was called Humpy Bong. So Tim sodded off to that. And Freddie sort of got us. He said, come on, you can't give up. Then I want to sing. So we decided we'd, uh, uh, you know, take the plunge. And uh, it was then then I sort of thought about the name Queen. Why Queen? I I know, at the time it was, uh, it was outrageous. Why did you say why queen? Uh, I thought about the name queen. Why queen? I don't know. At the time, it was uh, it was outrageous. Just go with outrageous. So here we have the main hall. In 1973, this is where Queen played, and this is really the first proper advertised gig we ever did, I would think. And it's certainly the first review we ever got by Rosemary Horride of what was then Disc. At the very beginning, Freddie was absolutely remarkable for stagecraft. He had a presence unlike anything that I'd ever seen, and I'd been a music journalist for a long time. Freddie, even from those days, had an ability to work an audience, and they would eat out of his hand. He could actually turn his hand round like that and do that, and the audience would stand up. I've sinned, dear father. It's like a magic. I have sinned. Try and help me. Won't you let me in? I think the first moment when I thought, my God, something's really happening here. People actually want to see us and, and they know what we're about. There had been a denim rock movement, if you like, with status quo, Uriah Heep. I just think Queen were an incredible breath of fresh air in rock music. They had brilliant songs. Freddie Mercury was an absolutely charismatic frontman. That's Brian true. May was just this brilliant guitarist, and Roger Taylor was a phenomenal drummer, and you had that guy that played bass. <laughs> <laughs> don't you ever talk about Deacon like that again. I don't want to hear him talk about Deacon like that. I don't like he that. He was looking for a bass player. We, we had several bass players. Very hard to find the right guy. Then we found John. Um, Deacon John on bass. So I came along in a way. It was a bit of an outsider at first. And it did take me quite a few years Is to sort of go like? more into the group, you know, and find myself, at, you know, at home, really. Mm. 
before we signed to a record label, we actually signed to Trident Productions, a management company run by the Sheffield Brothers, who had their own studio right in the middle of Soho. Recording our first album, we were all still just students finishing off our degrees. We had to do it in what time was available because. You know, the studio was being booked up all the time. So we had to go in, you know, sometimes it took like in the morning and sometimes, you know, you know, finishing at six in the morning. Yeah, all those sorts of weird times that nobody wanted. Mm. You know, you could see the working girls at night through their lace curtains. So while we were mixing, we'd have a little bit of uh, diversion. The album came out. What do you mean by diversion, Roger? and sort of resoundingly crashed. I mean, it did really didn't do much. Well, it's funny when you make your first album, you know, you go out into the record shops and you think, oh, we're in the record stores now, you know, and you go in and say, have you got the new Queen album then? And they go, what? <laughs> and it's a long haul. With Queen 2, I couldn't believe how much work we put into that. I think we felt we were evolving our own sound. We were pioneering this sort of multi-tracking thing. It gave you a tremendous palette. You could get massive choral effects with just three of us singing. That's when we sort of uh, first really got into production and went completely over the top. And there's a track on there called March of the Black Queen. I'll be your bad boy, I'll be your bad boy. This is the song. Very long, it's in about 11 different sections and, and the complexity of it is staggering. I mean, the tape is literally transparent. The 16-track, two-inch tape that was... Um, the oxide was compl almost completely worn away and we'd gone over it so many times, so many overdubs and bounce downs. It literally was transparent. It was really only with Queen 2 and Seven Seas of Rye that we had the breakthrough. We realised that really the easiest way of getting a hit album to have a hit single that has some musical validity. The key to that was uh, the stroke that was pulled in getting them on top of the pops when Bowie dropped out, and it absolutely broke that single. It was a very underwhelming experience for the very first time because there was a strike on at the BBC. So it was shot in the weather studio. It was great fun to be at Top of the Pops because it was sort of all happening. You felt like, you know. You said Top of It was great fun to be at Top of the Pops because it was. Oh, Top of the Pops. Oh, I'm an Arsenal fan, so we don't like. Sort we don't like Top You felt like, you know, you were, in a sense, becoming part of public consciousness. Top of the Pops was incredibly uncool. It was rubbish um, because nobody was actually playing. There was about 75 teenagers which were herded about the studio and a bunch of aging disc jockeys presenting it. Pants people were there, these very glamorous girls dancing. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. The BBC actually had a set of plastic symbols that went doop when you hit them, so it didn't, didn't make any noise. I think that sort of says it all, really. I suppose it's true to say we had slightly mixed feelings about Top of the Pops, because it wasn't very cool, but it was the great vehicle for selling records, so what can you say? It had a, quite a big impact, I know, because that record went straight into the top ten. So, obviously, the impact was huge then. <laughs> I just don't think the women were pregnant for all. I think that's why he didn't like it. If the women were prettier, I think Roger would have had a good time. We had this song called Seven Seas of Rye, but 
It's a universal truth that more groups break up because of songwriting arguments than anything else in the world, because your songs are your babies. The person who's written a song tends to be the one person who sees that one song all the way through from the idea they have in their head at first, you know, the final production, you know, the sounds on everything and the mix. Most of the time I have a clear picture of what, what I want and I sort of have a lot of say Rogers parts and what Brian should do and things. They are ours, of course. I've probably never spoken about this before ever, but I remember the 70s of writing, you know, it was Freddie's idea, he had the this lovely little riff idea on the piano, and I think all the middle eight is stuff that I did, so we definitely worked on it together. But when it came to the album coming out, Freddie went, I wrote that. And we all went, okay. <laughs> you know, it didn't seem like that big a deal, but Freddie said, look, you know, I wrote the words, and uh, it was my idea, so it's my song. The sort of unwritten law was the person who brought the song in would get the credit for writing that song, and the money for writing that song much much later in queen history i like that i like I, the credit not a big deal but i know money like can really end friendships and especially how you guys said uh, roger taylor's track was on the b side of bohemian rhapsody i would have been mad if that happened but i'm just like money money can ruin friendships so they, they're good for keeping it together b i'll just recognize 25 25, 25 25 25 so simple We hooked up with Mott the Hoople and we were the warm up act. Now I'm here. And we went all around the UK with them and it worked out just perfect. Now I'm there. Now I'm there. And then the guys from Mott said, Would you like to do the same thing in America? No! Okay, we're gonna have to wait for tomorrow for part two because I want to watch it so bad, but I know I can't. Okay, we're gonna have to wait for tomorrow. Hope you guys enjoy part one. See you later.